Okay, to get things started, give me your name, where you were born, and when you were born, and where you're now living. Mike Dimitrich. I was born in Murray, Utah, but at the time my family lived in Highland Boy, which is uh, now the Bingham Canyon Copper Pit. What was your birth date? My birthday was October 23rd, 1936, which makes me 78 years old today. And where did you grow up? Well, I actually grew up, uh, I, I went to the second grade in Midvale, Utah. And then my family moved to uh, Consumers. So I went to school in Springland till the fifth grade. And then I spent one year in Salt Lake grade school, sixth, sixth grade, and then I moved to Price. And then I lived in Carbon County ever since. Your family was in the mining industry? My, my whole family is coal miners. My, uh, my dad was actually uh, killed in the Kaiser Steel coal mine. My grandpa got killed in the Binger copper mine. Before, just before I was born, my dad got killed and I was working on the opposite shift at Kaiser at that time. My father-in-law was a state mine inspector and I had, uh, I think, about, I have eight uncles and six of them worked in the mining industry. Some started when they were 14 years old. And did you want to go down that same path? Well, I, I wasn't planning on it. I went to school on a football scholarship I had a bad shoulder. Uh, I injured it. Uh, I went up injured, and then I really injured in a spring football game. And so I thought my mother worked at J.C. Penney's. There was no money involved at all. And I thought, well, I'll go work in a mine a year and then go back to school. Well, I went to work at Kaiser, Kaiser Steel Corporation in Sunnyside, Utah. And I, uh, and I got working, and I got thinking, I can't have a better life than this. So I worked underground for two years, and then my father got killed, and then I went, quit the mining business, went into banking, and I was cashing all those guys I worked the mine with. I seen their checks were a lot better than mine. So I went back. Uh, it was about the time that the, the OSM Act come into effect, and I told the mine superintendent of, of Plateau Mining in Wattish, Utah, I said, I think you ought to have someone really track this because it's going to impact the mining industry a lot. You know, I was in the legislature at the time and we talked about it a little bit. And so he says, apparently you have someone in mind. I said, yeah, me. So he hired me. And so I got hired as a kind of a government affairs representative and I worked there for something like 30 years. So then I went consulting for uh, Consolidation Coal out of Pittsburgh and they owned the Emory Mine and so I worked for them for five years as a consultant. Then when I retired from the legislature, I retired from everything. So let's go back and talk a little bit more about how you became an elected official. Why did you choose to do that and what was your first office? How did you campaign? Well, well it was an interesting story how I got involved in politics. We had a local sheriff who was a very close friend of mine by the name of Al Pasek. And there was a movement like any small community to get rid of the sheriff. So he asked me to go, uh, if I'd go become a delegate to, to the county convention to support him so they didn't, you know, in those days you could, for 80% of the vote, you could kick him out, you know, a delegate vote. So I became a delegate and supported him. In the meantime, uh, uh, Representative Williams, who had the seat in the House at that time, retired. And Senator Omer Bunnell came to me and he said, I see you're kind of getting active in politics. Would you like to run for the House? Well, you know, Williams is quitting once you're in for the House. And I said, God, I don't know a thing about it. Never been in the Capitol or anything. He said, well, I can help you. And he said, and I said, well, first of all, better ask the bank if they'll let me go. He said, I've already did that. So he had, every, so he had everything wired up so much. Showed me how to campaign. I had a... Uh, I had a real tough opponent in the primary, a stake president, and uh, I thought, well, my political career is going to be short-lived. Well, anyway, I beat him and uh, went on to win, and I served, uh, I only had one other opponent, two other opponents in the House, and I served 11 terms in the House, 22 years. And then when Omer Bunnell, I, the only reason I stayed so long is I, Omer wanted me to take his seat in the Senate. He was a very close friend of mine, obviously, and. Uh, 
he kept saying, well, I'm not running next time. I'm not running next time. And pretty soon he finally just got sick, poor guy, and had to quit. So then I got appointed to the Senate. Bangor appointed me. And then I ran four elections for the Senate. So I served a total of 40 years, 18 in the Senate and 22 in the House. When you were elected, was the coal mining vote in Carbon and Emory County important to your election? Well, at, at the time in Carbon County, it was very important. Uh, at that time, we had two representatives from Carbon County. Hard to imagine. Well, we barely got one now, you know, for the whole area. Uh, and they were all union mines in Carbon. So that was very important at that time. Uh, so the union, the, blue, the union really basically kept me in office for a long time. And uh, there was a time, even when I was working for Plateau, which is a union-free mine, uh, the president of the United Mine Workers said, we can't support you anymore. I said, you want one of them, which I meant a Republican, or do you want me? <laughs> and so they laid off. Were there issues in the mining industry at the time that you carried forward from a legislative well, perspective? Well, there was two big issues. Uh, number one was mine safety and health. You know, we had a state mine inspection, total state mine inspection was the only thing we had. And then the, pretty soon the feds come in with the Ampshaw and they wanted to take over the total primacy of the state mine inspection. So, well, I obviously stuck, I stuck up for the state control on the thing and uh, lost out. So we really didn't have state mine inspection. We had the uh, Ampshaw looking over it. That was the one of the big issues. And at one time we had a dollar a ton mining tax credit for coal exported. And the funny story about that was is it was my idea that I worked with mining and I should put it on. Well, we had an issue in the legislature that they wanted to do away with eight under eight hour you, uh, law. We had, a, we had a state law that said you could not work underground for more than eight hours. And it was a direct slap in the face to the unions, number one, and to our coal miners, number two. And so I got involved in that fight. I, I just told those mine operators, I said, stay out of this battle. It's not your battle. It's a legislative issue. It's a Kennecott issue. It's not your argument. Well, I go up to the legislature the next Monday, and there's a letter passed out by all the coal operators supporting doing away with eight-hour workday. And it passed the legislature of the Senate by one vote. It was 15 to 14. We lost, and then we lost in the House, obviously. Well, I got thinking, if they're going to pull that on me, I won't get rid of that dollar a ton credit. And we did it. We got rid of the dollar a ton credit just to show them that you don't mess with a legislator. <laughs> anyway, it was kind of ignorant, and it didn't kill the coal industry. It didn't kill the export market, but it hurt those mines that supported that eight-hour workday. It, it just kind of spanked them for doing it. In the meantime, they lost that export market anyway. It dried up and went to uh, Australia. What, mar what were the markets for Utah's coal? Well, the base, the real market was Nevada Power, which is right down here in Moab, Nevada. And that, and, 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 they, and there's one up in Reno, uh, and they were the major ones, and then IPP was the big one. And that, that really kept the Utah coal industry alive. And as you're seeing now, IPP is going to go to natural gas, Nevada Power is going to natural gas, so the only markets we have now is Utah Power and Light. When you were first elected, um, do you remember what year that was? Yeah, 1968. Okay. How many coal mines were actually working in Utah? Well, the numbers, the numbers were the same of six, but the number of miners was like 1,700, mm. or something there. I don't know to really test my memory, but it. As a long wall mining, you know, that just started in Kaiser Steel. The first long wall mine in the United States went to Kaiser Steel in about 1967, 66, maybe earlier than that. But it was the only long wall we had. Well, eventually all the mines went to long wall mining. And that displaced for every uh, 70 miners that used to work on the face, there was 10. So we got as low as I think, I think there was over 2,000 miners before that came in, and then we got down to like 1,400. Did you? get involved in regulations? I mean, there was MSHA, but there's lots of other regulations that 
address mining. Were you involved with any of that? I basically made my living in the mining industry, tracking regulations and, and trying to take the positive step in, in implementing all those regulations. So I not only did uh, the state stuff, but I did federal stuff. We had a lobbyist in, in D.C. and I worked with him on some of that stuff with our congressional delegation. So the, the big issues then uh, is the same issues as we have now in the mining industry. The, division, uh, the Office of Surface Mining Act come in in 77, I think it was, and that just progressively got tougher and tougher to uh, comply with. And then uh, all this clean air stuff has really, really put dampers on it. What was the attitude in the mining industry toward all this regulation? Well, you know, basically they said we want to do it, we want to comply, and we want to do it right. And if it got over, overly burdensome, that's when they kind of took a little stance, let's pose this and let's pose that. To some extent, we were, we were able to make things better, but when it got to complying with, it, especially the Surface Mining Act, you know, you didn't have too much of a choice. And so I think the mining industry went out of their way to comply with the Surface Mining Act. How, how did the legislature feel about the federal regulation? Well, the legislature, you know, we, we took the primacy over with, with the State Division of Oil and Gas Mining. And then we passed a, a particular piece of legislation uh, that, that we could not make our state regulations any more stringent than the federal regulations. And you may have read about that this past legislative session in Utah on the clean air stuff. They try to repeal that deal, and we're just saying that you, we don't want any more our state regulations to be more stringent than the federal. And I think it was a good law. Over the period of years that you were an elected official, did, did the regulations get tougher and tougher and tougher over time? Was there anything that slacked off? The, uh, no, I don't think they slacked off. I think they got tougher on water quality, air quality. They progressively, then that'll come down from the EPA, you know. And I think they really got a lot tougher in there. Uh, you take the replacement of water was a real big issue in the mine. Tell me about that. You know, if, if, if we tapped into a, to an aquifer, and the water got drained in the mine or something and didn't and dried up the spring, we had to compensate that, that water company for that. We had that incident at Plateau where we had to help the Huntington water users because we dried up one of their aquifers and one of their springs. And so from that standpoint, I think it was good. I think it should have been done right. I don't think you should take somebody's water. And, uh, but uh, during all of these struggles with regulations and that, and we tried to maintain a workforce with, with proper marketing of our coal. And it was very competitive. Was there something special about Utah coal compared to, say, Wyoming or Nevada? Good, the very good point. You know, well, Nevada doesn't have any coal. Wyoming's coal is strip coal. We was lower in sulfur, and during the, I'm saying the mid-80s, they passed a federal regulation, EPA, that, uh, that you had to meet in certain quality of air emissions in power plants. And if we sold coal to back east at that time, they had to run it through all the scrubbers and stuff. Our coal was better before it got through the scrubbers than they, that they required, but it still had to be done. In other words, well, the low sulfur was the biggest selling point Utah coal had. Low sulfur and high BTU. Were most of Utah coal mines in the price vicinity? Well, there, it's, it's interesting. that Most of the Utah coal mines in Carbon and Emory counties were in the Book Cliffs and the uh, Wasatch Plateau. And it was kind of a horseshoe shape. And the interesting part of it, the horseshoe shape, you know, it started over there in Sunnyside up there, the coal mine. And that was high, highly gas, gassy coal. When you got to the Wasatch Plateau, it wasn't. So that was the big mining industry. But the biggest coal mine in Utah was Sufco, which is down in Sevier County. But the Emory Carbon Emory field was the largest by far. 
If you could characterize the relationship between the coal industry and elected officials, what would that look like? I think it was very positive. I think the state of Utah and the legislature, for example, realized the importance of the coal industry of the state of Utah. Not only, the, not only the, the royalty payments, which, by the way, was very important not only to the state but to local governments. Because of that 8% royalty, 4% come back to the state of Utah. Half of that came to the county that produced it, which was really big for carbon emery and, and severe counties. Mm -hmm. And the other half of that 50% 50, 50 went throughout the state budget into uh, community impact funds, which come back here, water resource stuff and stuff like that. So it was very positive from that standpoint. Were mining wages competitive with other kind of work in the state, do you remember? They were higher paid. In fact, Carbon County at one time had the, had the highest amount of savings account in the bank. Miners worked hard, they played hard, they spent it, but they always saved for that. In the old days, the mines used to shut down in the summertime. You know, the sugar beet industry was a big user. But they always had a large savings account. But they always made more than the average national wa uh, average wage in the state of Utah. Carbon and Emory counties were rich, con rich counties compared to San Juan County, for example, which was very poor. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was a very important industry. Looking back at your time in the legislature, what do you think was the most memorable experience in terms of regulatory changes? Probably, probably the OSM Act. When it first came in, it was a federal act, total federal act, and then we then we had the state take over the primacy of it. So they had to redraft everything to comply with the federal act and create a whole different agency in the state of Utah, which was a large agency, as you know. So that was probably the most memorable one, that. And the other come to mine safety. Mine safety was, was a big issue. Uh, you know, I was really professing that the state mine take the uh, primacy over, above uh, head of federal, uh, MSHA. And then it turned out that uh, the union objected to that. They wanted MSHA to take over. Well, as things developed, as we had a few disasters, then that, that role reversed. They want the state to take over, and, and, and we take the primacy and not federal. And that was a battle because we had no way of funding the state agency. In your role as a, as a consultant or an employee in the mining industry, did you find the legislature receptive to the mining interests? Did you have to do a lot of schmoozing and that kind of thing to get rules to be favorable t toward the coal industry? Well, I th I, the legislature really didn't play a particular role in that. The rulemaking stuff went through the agencies, and that's where more of that come in. And is, is, is the rulemaking done by the agency, we had to keep track of that because you know, the legislature's pass laws, and then the rulemaking implements that law. Mm -hmm. And nobody, if nobody's watching the rulemaking, you could really get hurt. So the rulemaking was close, and, and I think the cooperation was good. It just took a lot of time, and they really needed government affairs people to do that. Because the mine managers, their, their only interest was mining coal. And so someone had to look at the re what regulation is going to have an effect on them. Uh, some like new leases that come out, that was a big issue, you know, can we have, can we bid on this lease? If we bid on it, can we mine it? We have to get permission to mine it and all that, so that was a big, that was a lot of work there. Why were you interested in that sort of thing? It's making my living. Well, <laughs> I understand that, but I mean, why did you step into it the, in the first place? Well, I just, uh, I just come from a family of coal miners, and a very good, they made very good living off of it. And, uh, you know, some of the issues, like the black lung deal, affected many of my relatives, and many miners are affected with black lung disease. But in general, the mining industry paid well, 
and, and it got safer as years went by. When I, I worked underground for two and a half years, and there was people getting killed just about monthly. And now we're just about to zero fatalities, which is really good. And uh, so the interest was there just because of the people I grew up with. It's a mining community. Carbon County is a mining community. What was it like growing up in, in Carbon County with the mines being busier than they are today? I think, I think growing up in Carbon County is probably one of the greatest experiences a youth could have. You know, you, you was a lot around a lot of growing ups. There was a lot of stuff going on in, within the community, within the towns, you know. They had gambling, they had liquor and all that stuff, you know, until everybody cracked down on them. So you really got a life experience how to grow up in, in a world and be a part of that world. And so growing up with coal miners is great because they worked hard, they played hard, and they spend their money. There were union and there were non-union mines. Um, was that a point of tension? It was a very serious point of contention in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, there was only a couple non-union mines. And when the mine contracts come up and they would strike the federal, I mean the United Mine Workers would strike for their mines, then we had some serious mine uh, mine strikes within the county, some serious stuff where they rolled buses over and threw rocks through windows and all that. That's hard to believe, but that happened in the early 80s. And uh, eventually that pendulum turned and there was only one union mine now in Carbon and Emory Counties. That's Utah Power and Light Mines. And, and before there was only a couple non-union mines, uh, you know, so the pendulum really swung around. But at the time that was really tough. Uh, when the Wilbur disaster happened, was the first time non-union coal went into a union power plant, which was the power plants in Emory County. And, and that was Plateaus that did that, and we got a contract based on the fact the minute they went back into production, into the Emory County mines, that we got out of there, and we did. <laughs> but now the whole thing's opened up, and it's all non-union coal going in there now. I mean, a lot of non-union coal. So. I think the the hard core days of nine mine workers versus non union miners is gone. Why is that? I don't. I, I you know there's and I'm a very strong union guy, but there's a very strong anti labor organized labor deal throughout the country. And uh, when when I worked at Plateau, it was a union free mine. We paid more than the union miners made to keep the unions away. That's basically what it was. So all the non-union guys had to thank the United Mine Workers for their wages being just a little bit more than theirs. And so that do, you, do you have any impression whether safety in a union or a union-free mine were different? Well, having the experience with the one particular mine, with Plateau where I worked at, I used to attend there were mine safety meetings, and I think they were more stringent than the union mine because those guys, they'd have a guy from every section of the coal mine meet and tell management what was bad about that particular area in the mine. And there was immediate action taken to, to uh, clarify it. The union mines had the same thing, but they didn't have that many, they weren't required to have that many miners involved in it, so. But I think between the two, the mine safety was the very most, probably the most important thing there was. Was there a perception in the legislature about union versus union free mines? No. It was not an issue in the legislature. It, I think it would be today, but it wasn't in those days. In fact, the union, the United Mine Workers had a, had a lobbyist up there full time, which was good. And they, they needed that too, you know, just to have a, just a good public relations deal to have a guy. And they always had someone there that was really knowledgeable and did a good job. Did you work with that person? Yes, very good friends with them. When you were in the legislature, were you on any of the committees that were involved with mining? 
Well, I was on that select select safety committee appointed by Governor Huntsman after the Crandall Canyon deal. I was the legislative representative on that. And it was a great experience. Uh, worked with some real high quality people on that. And then I worked in natural resources. I was on natural resources committee just about my entire legislative career, which had a lot to do with my coal leasing and stuff. There were a lot of different communities in the Price Helper vicinity that were all tied to mining. Latuda, Kenilworth, you know, there's just bunches of them. Were those rival communities? Was, was there, were there relationships among the communities? You know, when I was in, in probably grade school, early high school, just about every mining camp had their own baseball team. And they got a lot of good baseball players. Some major leaguers, they'd get them a job in the mine so they'd play baseball. So they had the, the sports rivalry. Uh, Kenilworth had their own team. Uh, Wattis had theirs. Hiawatha was one of the big ones. Halper had a team. And so every little town had a little baseball team. And it was a big event for the people to go watch their team play. So they. It was really an interesting thing, and, and like I said, a lot of real good ball players came here as a result of that. What do you think has been the reason for the diminished production in the coal mines in Utah? Demand. The demand for coal is, is not there like it used to be. Like I said, we lost, we're losing all those power markets. And I think it's a sad day in the United States, when we get thinking we can produce coal from natural gas and solar and nuclear, and not necessarily nuclear, but solar and wind power, and I think your power bills are going to keep this growing out of sight without the coal-fired power plants. And that, that impact hasn't hit back east yet because they've been able to hold their coal-fired power plants going. But out here we've lost ours. They're shutting down the Castlegate plant. So, I think it's all market-oriented. Well, you drive through Price now, and it sure feels different than it did in the late 80s when I first... It's no longer a mining there. community, you know? It's an oil and gas community. They got the, the big oil, uh, the crude oil plant out in Wellington, where the Wellington washer plant used to be. And so, it's, it's kind of turning around a little bit, yeah. Yeah, the Castle Gate used to be a real neat mining community, and that's gone. All of it's gone. In your role as a legislator, what do you look back on with the fondest memories? The fondest memories? I think the fondest memories you have as a lawmaker is what you can do to help your communities or what you can do to help individuals. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. The college of that's now Utah State Eastern, I think, was a big issue, and it you know we had a branch in Blanding, really, and to get the new buildings we've got on those campuses, I think, has been a big addition and something to be proud of. I think improvements to Highway Six is a big, big, uh, big deal. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have that section of highway named after me, and people wonder why, but. I, you know, we made a deal. I was the only Democrat voted for the gas tax in 1992 or four, the last gas tax we had until this session. And I was the only Democrat, and I took a lot of heat for it. But I made a deal with Utah at that time. I said, I'm going to support you, but I want to see something done to Highway 6 every year. And they held it. They've held their word. And we've had a major project on Highway 6 just about every year. What did your family think about you um, getting into the political realm? Well, it, it was really tough on the family. You know, the kids were small and put a big burden on the, on the wife to raise the kids. And you really could not be a successful legislator without the cooperation of the family. Uh, my wife had some bad moments in the legislature, being alone raising kids. My kids had some bad moments saying that their dad was a legislator and all that. But when it all turned around, I think it was beneficial to everyone. I think everyone kind of enjoyed certain parts of it, not all of it, but they enjoyed it. 
Uh, we got to see a lot of the country together, my wife and I. Uh, went to a lot of different places, conventions and sort, legislative conferences. Can you think of anything that we haven't covered that's important for future people to know about mining and politics in Utah? You know, there's a, hundreds of abandoned mines out in the West Desert in Utah. And I think that's a real positive thing that the, the mining industry helped reclaim a lot of those areas, is that they're real safety factors. So, uh, and then the mines were required to put up substantial reclamation bonds to make sure they restore it. I know the plateau mine where we worked at, restoring that steep hillside was amazing to watch. They had a caterpillar actually tied on to another big caterpillar on a wire thing hanging down that hill while the operator's doing that. And so I think they've came a long ways in making things look better. There was Hard Scrabble Mine was the first big reclamation project that uh, Dogham did. Where was that? That's up, uh, that's up by uh, Castle Gate. It's, it's by the Utah Power, Utah Railways up that canyon up that way. And that is really, you'd never know there was a mine there. Did you have a role in in expanding that reclamation to other kinds of mines? No, no, but we did not fight it. You know, we were paying for it, but I thought it was a good public relations thing to kind of say that we're doing that to the people who are really advocating severance tax and tax and coal industry more, say, hey, they're doing a lot more for us than just mine and coal. So I think it was a good public relations deal. And I think it said, President, I understand other states are now doing that, too. If you had to do it over again, would you run? I, I would run, but I'd probably have to have my wife agree to it again if we did it again.